Okay, so I wanted to just go over um, some, a general overview of the, the curriculum, talk about certain things that we will be doing and why we're doing them. Um, so <clears throat> let me just read this. This is from our Academy pamphlet. Why did great painters and sculptors throughout history, Michelangelo, Raphael, Bernini, ultimately find themselves in the study of architecture? To be truly great as an artist, not simply an, it is not enough to simply be skilled in a certain craft. Artistic judgment, vision, and insight are at the heart of classicism. But this overar overarching aesthetic is not fully revealed through the particulars of a single discipline. There's not one single discipline that that is full that fully manifests classicism. Why is that? Because classicism as a transcendent aesthetic is overarching. That's the idea of an archetype. To, to be overarching is to be governing is to preside, and the aesthetic presides over the artistic statements and disciplines and fields, and that is what unifies drawing, painting, sculpture, and architecture, is the overarching governing principle of classicism that is transcendent, right? So part of transcendence is to unify the parts, it's the unifying principle of individual manifestations. So the manifestations in drawing. You can study drawing as an artist, but if you only study drawing, then you're missing a big piece of the equation, which is what unifies drawing with the rest of greatness. So that's why we stress every discipline. If we had somebody to teach us music, dang it, we would also do that. <laughs> because, again, when you see the bridge between music and painting, you see from a higher viewpoint of the two, right? You start getting a sense of what is the overarching governing principle of classicism so that when I make my statements in music, it is speaking way beyond musicians. When I draw, I'm speaking way beyond artists who like pencil and paper. We must move beyond our own little box. That's what classicism is all about, right? Transcendence. So that's one purpose of studying multiple disciplines, just to see what transcends each one. What unifies? When you start seeing that, you start getting big picture things. Architecture is the artist's closest ally in extending aesthetic principles into universal truths. The marriage of art and architecture does not just begin at the frame of a painting or the base of a sculpture. These sister arts share the very principles by which they are governed. The theory of architecture is as integral to the theory of art as architectural space is to artistic space. Understandably then, the greatest achievements of either field have come from those who have a knowledge of both, right? The greatest architects and the greatest artists are those who know the other side of the coin because they're inseparable. Architecture is really just, from the artist standpoint, it's just the way to frame our art, right? It's just a frame for us. And um, so we have to know, we have to understand the frame to speak in the most powerful way. Thus, an understanding of architecture is absolutely essential to the artist who wishes to go from common craftsmanship to extraordinary classicist, classicism. Simply put, architecture is essential to art. You cannot understand one without the other. Combined, they open the way for greatness. Okay, so let's get into a few of these particulars. 
Uh, let me first just read this statement um, that is just about the general purpose of all of this training. Just as the classical paradigm merges, with sup merges supernal ideas with natural forms, training at the academy will have a dual focus of cultivating the capacities of, art of artistic conception, imagination, while honing skills of observation and precision. This will entail training the memory and the imagination as well as visual accuracy in studying the laws and tendencies in nature as well as the character and parameters of the material language of art like just paint and clay and charcoal. Courses will include cast drawing, cast painting, still life, portraiture, master copying, history of technique, composition and design, sacred geometry, archetypal anatomy, structural drawing, perspective, color theory, plein air and landscape painting, imaginative realism, study the model from life in drawing, paint, painting and sculpture, with the totality of these courses finally culminating in the multifigurative compositions. Patterned after the Ecole de Beaux Arts in 19th century Paris, there will be competitions and awards throughout every facet of the program, including a pre-Rome competition. So Nikki is our inaugural pre-Rome winner. So that's, that's the intent of this, is to build towards that multifigurative composition um, that expresses all these skills at play with your own artistic statement. Because um, that's really the purpose of all these skills, right? We're not here to stay on the step of cast drawing. No matter how great it can be once you become good at it. We want you to be, to make statements that are timeless and transcendent and, and have an influence on culture, have a contribution to humanity. That's what it means to be a great artist, to be historic. And all of you can be that. Um, <clears throat> so, let me read the statement about classical drawing. Drawing is the artist's first language and primary skill, the root from which painting and sculpture grow. It is the most universal of all visual language, the most primitive and the most native to human expression. As such, the drawing is the most pure, direct, and immediate translation of artistic impulse. So when you draw that line, remember those cave drawings we looked at previously? Actually, maybe only Stephen remembers that, the Lascaux Caves. Their drawing is such a primitive yet universal language of thought to line, right? It's the purest form of artistic expression of thought and impulse. And that's where it all begins, is with drawing. If you see drawing as that, that um, fundamental principle of artistic expression, you see the importance of line. Uh, the raw simplicity of marking a surface with the hand's movement is as it is at once an act of both the mind and the body. You see that? When you draw, you are unifying mind and body. Hopefully, mind, uh, the, the greater your mind, the more you're unifying the action of the hand with the mind, right? The, the better your th thoughts and the better your skills. Every line is a trail of the action thought, a human record of the synergy of the inner and the outer being. Excellence in this precious skill opens the door to the artist's greatest achievements. If you spent 10 years doing nothing but drawing, 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 and you spent your 11th year sculpting, guess what? You would, you would jump into sculpting like a pro. You would be so advantaged over people who have sculpted for 10 years and never drawn. There are so many sculptors who sculpt, 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 and never draw. And they, they get to this level, and they can't get over it. They don't know what to do. 
how to, how to get to the higher level. Drawing is your most precious skill and your most universal in every other discipline. Architecture, uh, painting. If, if you can draw, you can see, you can measure with your eyes. If you can measure with your eyes, you can imagine without seeing. And you can conceive of things. You can conceive your ideas can turn from concepts to images. Because you, you know how things are constructed and you're familiar with relationships. Understanding drawing is understanding how things relate to each other and how to express feelings and ideas with forms. Okay. <clears throat> Classical sculpture. The ancient craft of sculpting has given a rich legacy to its sister arts, being the first of the visual arts to fulfill its classical potential. That's a little bit just me speaking, but I think it's, you, it's pretty verifiable that sculpture was the front runner of the sister arts in achieving transcendent classical, the, the classical aesthetic. There are reasons for that. But remember that sculpture really drew the cart. Ancient sculpture be became the, the perfect medium to embody classical concepts with classical forms. That's why I think it was the first. Because it embodies concepts more literally than drawing or painting. If you have a conception of the lips and you just draw it, you're drawing it two-dimensionally in perspective with the distortion of perspective. You're, you're, you're having to compensate for all those translations from three dimensions to two dimensions. In sculpture, it is what it is. To use modern wisdom, it is, it is what it is. <laughs> That's sculpture, right? It's, it's the literal translation of conceptual ideas, particularly ideas about the archetypes of the body. It expresses them perfectly. Um, the most tangible and measurable manifestations of ethereal ideas of the human figure. It remains the template for studying the artistic vocabulary of the body and canons of sacred proportion, being the three-dimensional med mediation from which painting and drawing derive their two-dimensional interpretations of nature. Any study of the classical forms of drawing and painting is incomplete without a study of sculpture. So get that in your head, no matter if you ever want to do sculpture as a professional again. It is essential for you as a painter and draftsman to understand things in three dimensions as you sculpt. It will open that door uh, to imagination, especially. Because if you can conceive it three dimensionally, then you can imagine it in a way to draw it. <clears throat> So uh, sculpture is really what draws the cart, leads the cart, draws it to. Uh, painting is, is really the princess who comes out of the carriage. And drawing is, I think, the carriage. So there you go. Um, drawing is the carriage. Sculpture are the horses that, that draw it. And painting is the princess who walks out. In other words, She's carried by those other two. She gets all the attention and the glamour, but she's really so dependent on, paint, on drawing and sculpture. OK, classical painting. <clears throat> Built on the traditions of drawing and sculpture, the grand objective of classical painting throughout the ages was not to faithfully replicate nature, but to intelligently translate it. The idea of replication is a mechanical practice brought by the advent of the camera. Before the camera, replication was not the standard of painting. So all of painting whose standard is all of painting whose standard is replication is really from the tradition of photography. Right? Replication is the tradition of photography. Translation is the artistic tradition. 
Classical painting is governed by artistic intelligence and intent, a process of purposeful emphasis and insightful filtering adapted to the limitations of two dimensions and the parameters of material qualities of paint. Photorealism, on the other hand, is a modern convention with none of the craft and acumen of artistic translation, owing more to the conventions of photography than the traditions of art history. In contrast, the intent of the, ma of the great masters was fidelity to the essence and the feeling of nature through qualitative rather than quantitative veritas or truthfulness. Art is about qualitative veritas, not quantitative. Okay. What time did I start? How long do I have? I... It's now noon. 23 minutes. 23 minutes. Okay. Classical architecture. The sacred temple, the eternal habitation, the immortal monument, these are the motivations and manifestations of classical architecture. While the visual arts reflect nature, architecture projects from nature an appendage of Mother Earth that encircles the mortal or extends towards the immortal. So let me repeat that. Architecture is an appendage of Mother Nature. That encircles the mortal or extends towards the immortal. Of the sister arts, it is the most obscure expression of earthly forms, but the most direct expression of cosmic laws. We're on page nine under classical architecture. The last sentence. It is also the most integrated of the purposes and priorities of the living. Reconciling aesthetics with physics, great architecture is the signature of the civilized and the landmark of accomplishment. So as we saw in Rome, architecture is the signature of a civilization, the remnants, the, the, the last standing symbol of what they cared about, their values. And by that we mean what is the highest that we value. Master copying. Now, of course, master copying requires a defense in the day where art is measured by originality, right? Why the heck would somebody copy another artist? Understanding art begins with seeing the greatness of the masters before us. This understanding multiplies by master copying, an exercise not just of seeing but of doing, and then of acquiring those qualities we seek. So first, recognizing who the masters are, what makes greatness in art, and then by copying, what are we doing? Emulating. We're emulating. This is what we would call connoisseurship. We are possessing. We're taking, we're stealing from them, their skills and their techniques in a way that simply looking doesn't do the job. Looking is like being told, paint, doing it is where it becomes experiential knowledge and now you own it. You, it's not just a matter of being able to say it, but to do it. And so master copying helps you get the habits of doing as the masters did. It is to follow the footpath, not just to admire the mountain. With every step, we become better acquainted with the genius and the genesis of greatness. To move the hand and the mind in emulation compels us to consider the thinking of the master on a level that the browsing eye cannot. This process also imposes the highest of habits in the creative and technical process, which will then govern our own personal expressions. So that's the motivation and the purpose of master copying is to leave it 
and be the guy after you've followed the guy. It's not a permanent habitation, but it's a necessary initiation to that level. The difference between painting from the model perpetually and studying the master of painting from the model is you get instruction of how to say what you're seeing in the language of painting, right? Because we cannot imitate nature perfectly, and nor should we, right? Photography is an illusion of that. But certainly, it doesn't do that either. No two-dimensional thing can. So if it can't, what is its highest calling? Is to have qualitative veritas, truthfulness, not quantitative, right? To express the essence of, of what you see, to capture it in the language with which you express yourself. Every language has its parameters, its limitations, but also its forceful potency if you use it properly. Okay, so that's why we master copy, and we, of course, do it, a lot of it. I'm, I'm sure we're criticized for doing it at all, or certainly to the extent we do. But it's because we care that art is a language. Okay, cast drawing. Studying from plaster casts highlights the essential ideas of light and form. These examples from classical sculpture embody this distillation of natural forms into aesthetic statements. Did you catch that? It's the reason why we're, we're not just drawing from rocks. Certainly rocks could test our accuracy and our sense of light and shade, right? But in the form of classical artistic statements, what does it do? That sculpture embodies the distillation of natural forms into aesthetic statements. Again, art is a language. We need to understand this language. Understanding the structure within the surface and the intelligence of its design coincides with drawing its two-dimensional reconstruction. From the primary division of light and shadow to the most nuanced subdivisions of tone, studying the effect of light on, simpler, on simple plaster lays the foundation for the most complex endeavors of describing the visual world. So in this simple plaster, all those subdivisions and transitions of shade will teach you the principles that you'll see in all the visual wor world. The visual world is composed of just two things, forms and light on forms, right? Light and form, that's it. It's all right here. Form, what's the shape, the structure of this form, and how does the light interact with it? If you can extend the lessons from cast drawing to the rest of the natural world, then uh, with confidence, you can say your artistic expressions. OK, cast painting. Cast painting is an effective introduction to the nature of color and to the language of describing the character of form through the medium of paint. So now we're recognizing that paint ha is its own language separate from drawing. The visual simplicity of a white plaster cast allows careful and critical study of color relationships that otherwise might be missed in objects of intense color. Because white is neutral, its influence on color from light is neutral. So temperature changes you see from light to shadow are not the effect of local color. See effect of light. You can understand the, the color, color theories of light on form simply because you have this neutral colored subject, right? Those things are harder to see on a blue shirt, especially with a pattern. I get confused with the pattern and the 
color of the shirt, and I forget subtle shifts from warm to cool and so forth. So the boringness of cast painting is its strength, right? That's the point. Everything shows on white, including the subtle temperature shifts imposed by the light. Thus a plaster cast can be the birthplace of any color statement and the training ground for the same governing principles in flesh tone. Flesh, again, is a neutral color. Not as neutral as white, but it's a subdued color. Additionally, cast painting will focus on, the, on using the qualities of paint and effective, to effectively translate the three-dimensional world. Students will lean on these skills with every future brushstroke, preparing them for the more challenging undertakings to come. So cast painting logically would proceed, say, figure painting, because you're juggling less things. So now we get to studying from life. We're getting close to the, you know, we're, we're, we can smell the gods on Mount Olympus from this point when we get to studying from life. We, we put off studying for life not because we don't value it, that we, not because we don't reverence it, it's because we think it's high-level stuff. We think it's high-level stuff not because it's hard. Portraiture is so hard. Yes, portraiture is hard, but it's the same difficulty as accuracy. And we can get that in cast painting and master copying and so forth, right? Studying from life is difficult because you're translating this living being to dead material paint on, two on a two-dimensional surface. And there's a tradition of doing that that we need to know. So studying directly from life has little to do with cam a camera-like action for the artist's translation progresses slowly. Every moment, its own dilemma of judgment. Every line, a living dialogue with the possibilities of creation. Every stroke, building on the previous toward a, synth a synthesis of the artist's depth of knowledge and the model's unexpected insights. Even the simplest drawing from life is, carefully, is a carefully crafted essay composed of many moments of discovery and, and comprehension, having layers of struggle and breakthrough, wholly absent from the split-second snapshot of an unthinking and uncaring camera. Did you get that? The struggle is part of the power and beauty of painting from life. Those decisions, correcting those decisions, compensating, like that nose we saw in that chin where you're three lines describing the nose. There's, there's an action and a counteraction and a compensation. And in the end, you've made a different statement than a camera would ever make by just a snapshot. It's, it's the compression of moments of decisions that make an artist and a piece of artwork timeless. When we study a piece of art, like when we, and it gets better the more we study it, it's because we're sort of following how it was created. There's a, there's a certain sense to a piece when it required decisions and it even failed. Sometimes, sometimes failure is, is the beauty of success. It gives potency to the final success. Um, many masterpieces from history are, can illustrate how imperfection can still be powerful artistically. What the camera scarfs up like a wolf, the artist must nibble away like a lamb. But in the process, something is uncovered just as it must be revealed apropos to the human mind, and thus to the classical method. OK, landscape and plain air painting. Studying as an honored guest before the majesty of nature, the artist must know when to listen and when to speak, when to curtsy and when to question. All the training in composition, color, and visual description is but preparation to be a, a ready steward of whatever precious insights are revealed. This is where Color theory meets its model, where the artist must learn to dance between the nature of color and the color of nature. Here, artistic technique is engaged as a translator in the battlefield of light and shadow, atmosphere and form, pulsating vitality and inert substance. If the artist can capture, hence, some fleeting insight, this gift from nature can be an enduring testimonial where it might otherwise be missed, like from a camera, to capture something essential. Um, B. 
because of your study, all the study that brought you to the, that moment, and then all the exertion and discernment and um, observation or digestion of what you're experiencing, what, what do you make permanent and what do you let go by as you're doing your work? All those uh, decisions culminate in what is your record from what nature's, what is the, the veritas that you have, um, have made a record of. Okay, archetypal anatomy. A uh, little passion of mine, of course. Archetypal, meaning the governing type of human anatomy. Archetypal anatomy is a study of the powers and principles at play on the structural and superficial forms of the human figure. From studying surface morphology to muscular anatomy to skeletal structure, we learn that the deepest part of us is also that which is most universal. The deeper you go into our nature, the more universal you get. That's why the skeleton is the most universal. If you saw Randy's skeleton next to my skeleton, you couldn't tell us apart probably, right? But I got lots of flesh hanging on my skeleton that shows the difference between us. <laughs> but as we go deeper, we go more universal. That's the idea of an archetype in general. It is in this inner realm that we begin to see the causes of the outer forms, and from this paradigm grows many familiar classical interpretations of the body. This method also provides the best framework by which to conceive and construct the figure, enabling the classicist to be a figurative artist of imagination, not just of imitation. Okay, sprint to the finish here. Multi-figurative composition. How much time? Seven minutes. Monumental history painting, the pinnacle of the painter's artistic ambition and classical expression, largely remains a ghost of the past, buried with other magnificent statements and epic allegories that were common when classicists were at the helm of the humanities. Today, the great key that has been lacking at virtually every traditionally oriented art school has been multifigurative compositions. Without concept and conviction driving every aspect of the art, the grand manner becomes the grand meander, overarching swag with underwhelming scope. What I mean by that is lots of swag, lots of showing off about painting fingernails, but not lots of scope in artistic statement, right? You zero in on a live model right there, and you think that's the end of all that I'm doing is to paint that. Well, you get overarching swag, but um, underwhelming scope. What's your, what can you say that you can only set up in your studio? Certain academies have made remarkable strides in, among subjects confined to studio poses, but few have understood how the methods of the masters were meant first and foremost to serve the imagination. Aspiring classicists must reclaim not just a command of craft and beauty, but also creativity and vision. When, when the most, well, when the most um, skilled craftsmen are also known as the most creative artists, then you can say, aha, we've bridged those two worlds. One is serving the other like it should be. Craft is serving creativity. Okay, sacred geometry. What does that have to do with classicism? Geometry is the armature of nature and the scaffolding of aesthetics. As an eternal language, it exists concurrent with all of creation and predates its own use. In other words, nobody invented geometry. It is timeless. And that is our purpose as classicists, to achieve the timeless. Dealing solely with archetypal forms, geometric concepts operate in a domain outside of time or matter, belonging to a set of non-physical truths that govern physical things and measure the intangible relationship between tangible things. 
Therefore, geometry is the qualitative measure of quantitative things, being the idea form of nature. Further, as both a language of measure and a language of symbolism, sacred geometry is also the quantitative measure of qualitative things, being the form idea of art. So it's the idea form of nature and the form idea of art it is therefore the mean between the laws of the universe and the laws of aesthetics, justifying the claim that classicism, the philosophy flowing from geometry, is the aesthetic as timeless as the cosmos, natural and sensible to any that have or yet will inhabit this universe. As such, we cannot commune with the ancients without delving into its mysteries. We cannot ensure an audience into the eternities without employing its principles. In other words, geometry is a language of symbolism and truth. It is timeless. And when we use geometry through how forms are designed, but also how compositions are designed, we can speak to truths that will be universal. As long as geometry exists and people can understand it, they will understand our art. So that will be part of the depth of, of, an, of your artistic statement, is understanding how to use geometry. OK. Last one. The what? The bel composto. Yes, so the bel composto. Thank you. The, what is a bel composto? It is the combination of artistic statements, different languages together to say, to, to enforce the same thoughts and ideas. So a bel composto comprises architecture, sculpture, painting, all culminating and reinforcing, synergizing the same artistic statement. That is the powerful culmination of the classical aesthetic is as a bel composto, a proof that these languages are coherent with each other and can be then transcend each other, right? It is, it represents the transcendence of art and really should serve transcendent ideas. Okay, well, that's it. That's what we're about. Okay, anything else I missed?